one and tap that three. Hosea chapter one. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the heights of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Goma, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the, Lord, in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should, not, that, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Also chapter three. The Lord said to me, go, show your, life to your, go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. For love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me for many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. For the Israelites will live for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or house gods. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. So I'm first going to warn you um, that the sermon is going to be a bit all over the place. So please bear with me. Um, Kun was supposed to preach today, and unfortunately, uh, he fell ill, so um, he's doing better now, uh, but I decided to step in on Friday, um, so you've signed up for a treat. <laughs> um, so the title of my sermon, I decided not, I decided not to make any slides, um, so the title of my sermon is The Prophet and the Prostitute. So over the summer, we've been um, doing sermon series on the stories of the Old Testament, the stories of the Bible. So you pick one Bible character, and then we preach um, about them. And today, I decided to speak about the prophet Hosea and the prostitute Goma. Before I begin, I would like to start with a story. Um, so this is a story which happened, those of some of you, most of you know um, that I'm from Ghana, so for those of you who don't know, and um, this is a story which happened in Ghana. It's a story between, you know, these two guys who went for a job interview, and um, it was a position in the government, um, and you know, because of the economic situation in Ghana, um, a lot of people applied for this position, but they, they, um, they had rounds of interview, and then in the end, it came down to two people for the final interview. And so the day of interview had come, the first guy went in, and then the interviewers were set. So the, the first question was, um, you know, because it's a government position, they wanted to interview about their knowledge, interview them about their knowledge of the, of the country. So the first question was, when did the country gain its independence? And then the guy was like, you know, many events happened here and there. Um, there were several things happening, and eventually it was 1957. And that was perfect. So they move on to the next question which was, um, who is the father of the nation? 
And then the guy was like, you know, it's not fair to mention one man. There were several men involved. Um, some people even believe that there were six men involved. And that's true. There were six people who led the country to independence. And then last question was, what do you think about corruption um, in the country? And then the guy said, you know, it is currently under investigation, so who am I to give any um, conclusion? So we should wait. So remember the first um, answer? Um, several things happened. There were several events here and there, and eventually it was 1957. Second one was, um, you know, who am I to say one man? There were several men involved. Some people believe it was six men. Um, and the last one was, it is currently under investigation. So the guy did very well, impressed the interviewers. He came out, and then he met the second guy who was to go in. And then the second guy was asking, what were the questions? And then the guy was like, you know, I was told not to tell the questions to anyone. Um, and then the guy was, all right, you tell me the answers. And then he thought, okay, I'll give you the answers. So he tells him the answers. The first one, there were several events. Uh, many things happened here and there, and eventually it was 1957. Second one, who am I to say one man? Um, there were several men involved, Ted one, it is currently under investigation. So the guy goes in, and then the interviewers were going through his CV, and then they realized that the guy didn't put his date of birth. And so they said, when, when were you born? And then he said, you know, several things happened. There were many <laughs> events here and there. And eventually it was 1957. And the interviewers were puzzled. And so they go on, and then they ask, um, who is your father? Who am I to say one man? You know, there were several men involved. <laughs> Some people even believe there were six men involved. <laughs> and at this point, the interviewers were really, really puzzled. And they were like, is there anything wrong with your head? It is currently under investigation. <laughs> so this is how my sermon is going to be, right? <laughs> OK. I think now we can pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you that, God, you would use such an image to demonstrate your love to us. An image of a prostitute and a holy prophet being married. Lord, we pray that as we go into your word, Lord, may you speak to me, Lord. May you speak through me as well, Lord. And we pray that, Lord, as we listen to your word, Lord, may you open our eyes and our ears, Lord, to see, Father, the magnitude of your love. You love us. And, Lord, we are grateful for that. Although we are weak to love you back, your faithfulness, Father, towards us never ceases. So we want to thank you, Lord, and we want to praise you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before I start, um, just want to give you a brief background about um, what was happening during the time of the prophet um, Hosea. So Hosea was prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel. If you read 2 Kings, the kingdom of Israel was split into two, the northern and then the southern kingdom. And at this time, Hosea was the one who was prophesying to the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was being ruled by, by King Jeroboam II. And Jeroboam II was considered to be, if not the worst, one of the evil um, kings that Israel had ever had. He had led the nation completely astray. There were many evil things going on on the land. But interestingly, at the same time, the nation, the northern kingdom of Israel, was considered to be the wealthiest among all the times, all the kings who had been um, in the northern, northern kingdom. The kingdom was very wealthy. The kingdom was enjoying a moment of peace and security. There was so much comfort. There was technological advancement. You know, things were going pretty well, materially uh, speaking, for the kingdom, for the northern kingdom. However, the people had completely abandoned God. So if you read the chapters from chapter 4 onwards, God keeps on, in almost every chapter, God keeps telling, telling them that you do not acknowledge me in any of your ways. So the people had abandoned God. They had forgotten about God. They had forgotten about his covenant. And the nation 
had become very adulterous. They were going after other gods. They were going after smaller gods, gods of other nations. Not only that, there was sexual immorality everywhere in the, in the whole kingdom. There was maltreating of the poor. The poor were becoming poorer and poorer, and the rich were becoming richer and richer. So every evil you can think of, it was taking place in the northern kingdom at this time. And if you think it cannot get any worse, the very altar, so you remember in Leviticus, Moses said, Moses instructed them to build an altar for sin offering, right? So this is where they would atone, they would make sacrifices to atone for their sins. So the very, the very altar for sin offering had actually been converted to a place where they could sin. So the very place, imagine all the evil that was going on in the land, right? And then they have an altar for sacrificing for forgiveness of sins. That's the place they could come for forgiveness of all the sins, all the horrible things they were doing. Even that place had been turned into a place of sin. So this was the state of the northern kingdom. And so God decides to send his prophet, Hosea, to go and prophesy to the northern kingdom. First of all, to remind them of his covenant relationship with them. And second of all, to warn them of their impending destruction. Because after the prophecy of Hosea, after God's message to, through Hosea to his people, the people were going to be destroyed. The northern kingdom was going to be destroyed. So Hosea was the last prophet to the northern kingdom. In other words, the message God gave to Hosea to remind them about his covenant with them was the last message that God was going to give to a sinful nation. And afterwards, the nation was going to be destroyed. And I think this is very important. There are a lot we can learn from this because if God is giving his final message to a nation as evil as the northern kingdom of Israel, what sort of message is God going to give them? What is God trying to tell them as his final message and then distraction? So that's what we are going to look at. And there are three things from the Bible passages we read. There are three things that I think we can learn uh, from the final message of God to his people. So the first of all has to do with the nature of his love. In his message, we can see the nature of the love of God. Second of all, second has to do with the magnitude of his love, right? How deep his love was. And lastly, the saving power or the redeeming power of his love. So first, the nature of his love. Second, the magnitude of his love. And lastly, the redeeming power of his love. So let's take them one by one. First, the nature of his love. What was the nature of God's love? In fact, what is the nature of God's love? I think it's a marriage kind of love. You know, there are several, God, throughout the Bible, God uses, on several occasions, God uses, dif uses different analogies or metaphors to describe his love, how he relates to us, right? But I think the most consistent and probably the most powerful analogy God uses to describe his love is marriage. Think of the Bible in general, right? The Bible begins with marriage and ends with marriage. In Genesis, it was God making or instituting marriage. In Revelations, God talks about restoring marriage, which means that everything that happens in between Genesis and Revelation is actually sort of God trying to prepare us or trying to redeem us for the better marriage which he created in the beginning. So in the, in the end, what he's going to do, the end goal is to restore marriage, which is to prepare us as a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. So everything that has been happening in between, including our current time, is God preparing us for that. So God demonstrates his marriage, his love through marriage. You know, I have shared this before, but I really, really love the Dutch word for marriage. I think it was Hendrik who once uh, drew my attention to this. That the word trown, right, literally translates as faithfulness. You know, marriage in English doesn't really, you, you really have to go, you know, for marriage counseling to really understand what marriage is. You can't deduce one meaning from marriage by just looking at the English word marriage. But in Dutch, it's trown, faithfulness, right, which means that the primacy of marriage or underneath marriage is faithfulness. And this is the kind of love that God is reminding his people of, that his loving relationship with them, his covenant with them, is one of loyalty and faithfulness, for better, for worse, in rain or shine, in death 
or in life. It's the nature of his love. You know, love, I'm trying to find the best way to put this, but love always comes with knowledge, or love is embedded or hidden in knowledge. Maybe the other way around. But what I'm trying to mean is that, you know, being very personal, sometimes people tell me that, you know, Frank, I think you are really a kind man. Or Frank, I think you are really patient. And, you know, as soon as they say that, I look around my shoulders to see if my wife is not around. <laughs> because the, the right person to be, to be most sincere, to give the most vivid description of who I am, is my spouse. Is the one that I am most intimate with. Why? Because she has the most knowledge. She has seen everything about me. She has seen my nakedness. She has seen my vulnerability, my fears, and my insecurity. When I'm outside, I can hide them, but I cannot hide them with my spouse. She will find out. So the people you are most intimate with have the most knowledge about you, and because they have most knowledge about you, in that case, love makes most, love makes most sense. When someone who truly, who is intimate with you, knows you from the inside out, right, tells you you are beautiful, you take it and you really believe it. When people who don't really know you are just friends and not really intimate with you, might tell you you are kind, might tell you you are very patient, might tell you great stuff, you will believe it, but only to some extent. If everybody is telling you you are great and your spouse tells you you are not, that's what you are going to believe. You are going to believe what your spouse is telling you because no, they know you from the inside out. And so what God is doing here is saying that I am the one who really knows you. I know how sinful you are. I know your fears. I know you've gone after other gods. And yet, in my final message to you, what I want to remind you of is my faithfulness, is that I love you. Can you imagine that? This is the nature of his love. With all the knowledge he had about them, he has about them, the vulnerability he sees, the prone, they being prone to wander away. They had abandoned him, like I said in the beginning, verses upon verses, God keeps reminding them, you do not acknowledge me in any of your ways. And so the way God goes to remind them through his prophet Hosea is to ask a holy prophet of God to be married to a prostitute to demonstrate his faithfulness to them. Can you imagine that? A holy man of God going to the brothel to look for a wife to marry. Now just picture this. In a state where the people are really sinful, right? They had abandoned God completely. God was about to allow other nations to come and destroy them completely. He is sending his last warning to them for them to come back to him. And then he sends his last warning through a holy man, Hosea. But this holy man is married to a prostitute. Imagine how the people were going to take the message of a holy man who is married to a prostitute. Imagine Hosea being in a queue with other men in line, sleeping with his wife, and then still warning the people that God's destruction is at hand, that God loves you and he's a holy God. And I believe that people will just look at him and then ask him, how can a holy man like you, Hosea, be married to a prostitute like Goma? And I guess he will look around and tell them, how can a holy man, how can a holy God be married to a nation like you? A nation that had completely abandoned him, a nation that had gone after other gods. How can a holy God be married to you? This was God's message. This was the nature of his love. Now, the magnitude of his love. How deep is the love of God? You see, you might think it's, this is worse enough, right? A holy man being married to a prostitute. But it gets worse. In the chapter 2, what happens is that, so, the, Hosea is married to the prostitute, right? They have born, they, they, they have children, and then what happens? You might think that, well, maybe God was telling him, you know, be married to a prostitute and then she will not go back to prostitution, right? She's converted. But no, actually God warns him that you'll be married to her, you will have children with her, and for the rest of her life she'll be living as a prostitute. So imagine, she's married to 
Hosea, a holy man of God. And then during the day, she's at home taking care of the children, being with her, being with her husband. And then at night, she lives in the brothel. This is what God told him, that this is how it's going to be. And this is how Goma lived. She continued to live as a prostitute. Although he's mar- she's married to a holy man of God, she continued to sleep with men after men after men after men. Men were paying to sleep with her. Although she was married, imagine the heartache of the prophet Hosea. Imagine what she was going through. And this is what God wanted to demonstrate to them. What God wanted to demonstrate to them was that they had gone after foreign gods. They had gone for idols. They had gone for gods from other nations. And because of that, it breaks his heart. But why does it break his heart? I think St. Thomas Aquinas, he, he describes three ways we use language, right? If God is God, is it possible that the language God uses is the same language we use? If God says something, right, and we say the same thing, do we mean the same thing? So he mentioned three ways that we use language, right? He mentions the univocal sense, the equivocal sense, and the analogical sense. I'm only going to talk about the analogical sense because the other will take time, the other two. So the analogical sense of language, he gives an example like this. If God says, if you love someone, you really genuinely love someone, and then after a while, the person doesn't love you again, but leave you. You hurt. But why do you hurt? You hurt because you feel like you have lost something. You genuinely, sincerely love someone, and the person doesn't love you back. You hurt because you have lost something. If God genuinely and sincerely loves you, as we believe, and you don't love him back and go after something else, he hurts also. But why does he hurt? Because you have lost something. So that is the analogical sense of language. When God says, I love you, and then he's hurt, he's hurt because you are losing something. If we say we are hurt, it's because we have lost something. What is the opposite for God? Because you are losing something. And this is what he's trying to demonstrate, that you are going after. And throughout all the Old Testament, God keeps repeating and repeating You go after foreign gods, and these gods cannot talk. They do not have mouth. They do not have ears. And these gods are going to disappoint you. They are going to break your heart, and they are not going to be forgiven to you. You might think it's the olden days. You know, they were making idols, physical idols for everything. But we follow the same idols in our time. Idols of money. Idols of pleasure, comfort. Idols of career, success. Idols of being too busy. Idols of even family, your spouse, if only I can get her to marry me or if only I can get him to marry me, then I'll feel like my life is complete, then I'll feel happy. It's an idol. If only my kids will grow up to become like this, your expectation and your vision for your kids, if only my kids will become like this, then I'll be happy. Then I'll feel satisfied. Then I'll have a meaning in life. It's an idol. Whatever we put ahead of God, whatever we, if we look at anything and demand satisfaction from that thing, and that thing is not God, it's an idol. That's the basic definition of an idol. So although the people in the ancient times, the Israelites were very overt with their idols, they would make physical object for money, physical object for sex, the Greeks did that all the time. Physical object for career success, physical object for being, you know, considered as a smart person. They did all of that. We do that in our heart. And it's even more dangerous than being covert about it, than being overt in the open about it. And what God is saying is that if you follow any of these gods, gods of money, right? If money is what you look at for, you look to for satisfaction, if money is more important to you than God, what happens when you don't have money? What happens when you lose it? And of course, at some point, you are going to lose it. If your spouse or your family, your children, is what is more important to you than God, if that is what you look at for satisfaction, for, only, for what only God can satisfy, what happens when they pass away? And of course, life is full of sickness. There is death everywhere. They will be taken away. 
if being considered as a smart person is what is what you 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 idol, you idolize, then you always feel like a fraud on the verge of being found out. If power is what really drives you, then you would need more power to succumb your fear. Because when you see anyone more powerful than you, you are afraid that you are going to lose your power. You'll be a slave to whatever, whatever you consider as an idol, whatever you have an allegiance to. So when Bible talks about sin, the Bible is not talking so much about the actions. The Bible talks so much about what is underneath the sin, the sin underneath our sin, which is what we owe our allegiances to, be it money, be it sex. Think of it, adultery. Why would someone be adultery if the person had not already idolized pleasure in their heart? Think of money. Why would anyone put money or why would anyone sin with money if money is not something they have idolized? Whatever actions we consider as sins, they come from a place of allegiance we have with something else. Money, sex, power, career. We sacrifice everything for career, don't we? We sometimes put our kids even on the altar of career, don't we? And this is what God is saying, that every idol you go out for, my love for you is this analogical sense of love, that I love you and I want you back because when you break my heart, when you walk away, I have not lost anything. You cannot add anything to me. You have lost everything. That's the magnitude of God's love. How deep his love is. How wide his love is. How high his love is. Last point. It's a love that redeems. See what is happening. You think nothing worse could come out of this passage. Let's look at the verse 1 of the chapter 3. The Lord said to me, so in the chapter 1, the Lord says to Hosea, right? In chapter 2, he says again. In chapter 3, he says something again to Hosea. And this is what he says the second time. The first time was, go and marry a prostitute. And then when you live with a prostitute, right, she's going to betray you in chapter 2. She's going to wander and be sleeping with other men. She'll be living in the brothel, right, as if that wasn't bad enough. In chapter 3, go show your love to your wife again. You see what he's asking of his prophet? After he, had, he has betrayed you and living in the brothel, go and show your love to her again. I continue to read. Though she is loved by another man, and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they tend to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So, this is what Hosea does, because that's what God instructs him. Because of this, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver. You see what is happening? Other commentators believe that what was really happening was that Goma had been living in the brothel, the brothel for, for quite a long time, and the pimps, you know, have been uh, maltreating her. They have been, you know, abusing her, um, cheating her, and all of that, um, made a lot of money out of her, and now they want to get rid of her. So the final thing they want to do to the prostitute was to put her on auction. The final thing they want to do with her, the final money they want to suck out of her was to sell her by putting her on auction. And so what is happening here is that God is asking Hosea to go and then bid for her wife, for his wife, to go and purchase her and bring her back and live with her as his wife. Can you imagine a holy man of God, a holy prophet going to the brothel where they had put his wife, Goma, on sale, and you can imagine for a prostitute to be put on sale, they have to make her naked so that her bidders will see um, her nakedness. Imagine she's being stripped of all dignity, all value. She doesn't have anything to hold on to. The only thing she has to hold on to is to close her eyes for a second so that she wouldn't see what was happen happening to her. That was the only thing left of her. She doesn't have any value. She's not going to add any value to the life of Hosea. And yet God is asking to go and bid for her and pay for her, pay 15 shekels. So you can imagine the bidders bidding, you know, one shekel and two shekels and five shekels and six shekels, eight shekels. And all of a sudden she hears a voice which sounds familiar. 
10 shekels, 12 shekels, 15 shekels, and it's the voice of her husband coming back for her. This is what is happening in the passage. God is doing this with Hosea to demonstrate his love towards his people, Israel. Although they were going to be destroyed, although they had been devalued completely because they had gone after foreign gods, the land was full of sin. Even the place where they could ask for forgiveness of sins had become a place where they sinned themselves. What value is of them? What are they going to add to God? Nothing. And yet, God was willing to even die for them. God was willing to redeem them because they are worth everything. You see the parallels between Hosea and Jesus? He knew his people were going to disown him. He knew his people were not going to believe him. And yet he went to the cross. One of the Bible passages that really sometimes make me very, very emotional is Isaiah 49. So in Isaiah 49, I think I preached on this before. Isaiah 49, what was really happening is that the people had been, you know, um, they, they see an impending danger. The Babylonians are coming for them, and they feel like, you know, they look left and right. Nothing was working for them, really, and they feel abandoned. They feel forsaken. And so this is what they say in the verse 14. In the verse 14, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. So they are living with no hope that God had completely forsaken them. They are going to be destroyed by their enemies. There is no value. There is no joy in the land, no peace. Everything is just going against them. And they feel like, you know, why are all these things going against me if God is still for me? Why am I going through all of this? Why am I experiencing all of this if God is still there for me? That's basically what they were saying. And look at what God says. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? And have no compassion on the child she has born. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. In a period of dissolution, in a, in a period where they feel like everything is gone, everything is lost. God is far away from me. We don't feel our faith anymore. We don't even know if we believe in God anymore. God is telling them, do you think I've forgotten you? Can a mother forget the, nest, the baby they are nursing? And even though they may at some point, because we are humans, I will never forget you. Regardless of what you feel, regardless of what you are going through, if you belong to me. And then, what is even more striking is the next verse. See, I have engraved you on my palms, on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. You see what God is saying? You know, engraved, you might think, that, you know, it's just like a, you know, like a tattoo, right? God has tattooed us on his palm or each, each of us individually on, on, on his palm. But this is much deeper than that, right? This is much, 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 much deeper than tattoo. The engraved, the Hebrew word for engraved here is actually to engrave with a chisel and a hammer. In his palm, you and I. Do you think he will ever forget And several centuries later, when Thomas was doubting, after the disciples had disowned Jesus, after none of the men went except John, went with Jesus to the cross, to, to, to Golgotha, when all of them were hiding and they had completely betrayed Jesus, and then Jesus resurrected, Thomas was doubting. He was doubting if Jesus was going to restore them. What does Jesus do? Jesus says, look at my palm. You think I'm going to leave you? You think I've forgotten you? You think I'll forsake you? See, you are there in my palm. I have engraved you in my palm because you are so precious. Even when people think you have no value, regardless of how you feel, you think you are feeling desolated. You think you are feeling rejected, lonely. You feel like you don't believe in me anymore. You feel like you have been too busy for other things in life and because of that, you don't even have your devotions. And because of that, you feel like I have rejected you? Look at my palm. I'm going to end with a few words from the hymn writer. Jesus sought me when a stranger 
wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. I am prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here is my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy court above. You see what he's saying? I am prone to leave you, God. I am prone to wander. But God was coming after him. And in the same way, God is coming after you and I. Let's pray. Okay, I'm going to do something. If you feel like this message spoke to you in any way, maybe it makes, me, it makes you feel like, you know, this is the covenant relationship God has with his people, and covenant always has to be renewed, right? You always, we always have to redo our vows. And that's what God was doing. He was redoing his vows through his prophet, Hosea. Maybe that's how you feel. You feel like redoing your vows. Or maybe you feel so empty. Maybe you feel dry. Maybe you feel like, you know, you don't feel God anymore. Or maybe you just want to express how much you love God. As we sing the next couple of songs, may I invite you to just, just come and stand here if you feel, if you, if you feel free. Um, just come and stand here in the presence and then we all worship um, together. The reason why I'm asking you to stand and not to sit by where you are is sometimes just making a physical step. It's also a reminder for you that you are making that step again. You are redoing your vows. You are bringing how you feel to God or you are showing your appreciation to God again about how much he loves you, the bounds of his love, how high his love is for you. So as we sing um, the next um, songs, please feel free um, to come and stand here and then we worship. Just lift up, stand here, lift up your hands in worship whilst we all sing the song um, together. So let's worship. <laughs>